written much more in the Jewish culture. It's an idiom in the ancient world, and of the Jews in particular, that refers to, I love one thing more than another. We hear it in relationship to Jacob, to his wife Rachel, his wife Leah. When he says, it says, Leah was hated. It does not mean that Jacob did not love her. Rather, it means that he loved Rachel more than he loved Leah. And so when Jesus is speaking about this, he says, the cost of being a disciple is that you will love God more than yourself, more than your own blood. That the call of discipleship goes beyond even that intimate link that we have to blood, to kin, to family, to friends, and even to our own desires. And that if I choose to be a, God, a disciple of Christ, I partake in this cost. And I will choose God first in my life, and that I will love him with the total commitment, even to the point that as the Gospel of Matthew says, do not think that I have come to bring peace on the earth. I have come to bring peace, not peace, but the sword. The point that he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Which leads to the second cost, where he says, whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. The reality that the two can be one in choosing to follow God wholeheartedly, we accept our cross. We accept the gift. Sometimes it's heavy, sometimes it's light. And in the story that I began with about Sam Kendricks, he was intently looking for a symbol, the cross. He intently heard the song. And we have our own symbol as Christians, and particularly as Catholics. Right up there. It's the cross, the gift, and the call to imitate Jesus Christ. Because in order to call us to discipleship, he had to lead the way. And he connects heaven to earth, and each one of us to each other on earth. And the call to give up ourselves, and to lift high the cross, and to carry it. And the reality in our own vocations in the married life, that we are called to love our spouse. Not above God, but we are called to love God first. And in loving God, we will see God, see Christ in our husband, in our wife. And at times we may think, they are sure being a cross to me, and they're dragging me down. And at other times we may think and believe that they are a ladder helping us to climb to heaven. In both of those instances, whether the cross is light or heavy, is the vocation in which we seek to get to heaven. And then the two parables Jesus speaks, he talks about the fact that we must be deliberate and we must reflect upon the call of discipleship. When it comes to the constructing of the tower, what is he saying? He's saying, you must think about what does it cost? Do I have the ability and can I complete it? Lest I be laughed at, lest I be mocked at. Those same words to be laughed at also reflect in the Gospel of Luke, the Jesus' crucifixion. When those who look at him laugh at him and mock at him because he thought he could save others, but he can't save himself. And in our own lives, when we bear our cross, whether it's a temptation or thought of mine or an act, before and when we're tempted, in the back of your mind, you say, I know this is wrong, I shouldn't do it. And you hear that little voice that says, it's okay, nobody's watching. You can do it. And then what happens when we do the action? Suddenly that voice that said, don't worry, there's nothing wrong, says, I can't believe you. God's not going to forgive you. And you might as well not go to confession because there's no way. Because after all, you've got to go to a man. It's not like God can forgive you. And yet the reality is with humble and contrite heart, we go before God through his instrument, the priest. And we say, I have dropped my cross. I have failed in this time of temptation. I desire to pick it up, not for love of myself, but for love of you, God. Please accept my forgiveness. And then we continue forward, having deliberated and reflected on the cost of it. 
Which leads to the second example that Jesus gives, the parable of the king preparing for battle. The reality is that having assessed what it costs, we have to have our skin in the game. Because what happens if you're the king with the fewer soldiers and you lose? You might die. Do we, in our commitment to Christ, give of ourselves totally? Having reflected upon it and discerned and said, yes, this is what I can do. I wish to follow the symbol. And I wish to live that out in my life. Do we give it our all? Which leads to the third cost. Having spoken about that we have to put God first in our life. We have to carry our cross. The third cost. Renouncing our own possessions. The reality on face value is that Jesus is telling every one of us, go empty our bank accounts and put it at the feet of the church like we hear in the Acts of the Apostles. And the question is, how many of us could do that? And how many of us couldn't do it? Early in the church, St. Gregory says, if you are not able to give all up all, be masters of your earthly possessions. Let them not gain the mastery over you. And the reality is that if we are called to renounce everything, in particular we think of religious life, a call to poverty, then we are, if not, we are called to be the stewards of the possessions we have, to take the time, the treasure, the talent, what we possess, what we have, and to recognize that it is not mine. Although it says, even Vatsik on the checking account, I have been called as a steward to use that money wisely and to assist others so that all of us can get to heaven. The reality of that stewardship is the question of possessions. Finally, there is a radical call to commitment that is missing, which is the final set of verse where it talks about the salts of the earth that if the salt goes bad, what do you do with it? Throw it out, because it has no flavor. And if you've ever had this happen, you know exactly what I'm talking about. There's nothing like putting a whole bunch of salt on something, and you take a bite, and there's no flavor. What is it good for? To throw it in the trash can. And the reality is that we must give our 100% commitment to be a disciple. Having given the three points of the cost, he asked them, will you ratify? Have you read the fine print before you click the I agree, submit? And will you do it? Because if you will, then you seek heaven. You seek to be not only with me, but with God the Father, God the Son, all the angels and saints who have gone before us and his mother in heaven. Which leads back to the symbol in the song. At the beginning, I said that our symbol is the crucified Christ, and our song is the Angelus, that every day rings at 6 a.m., at noon, and at 6 p.m. And I can promise you at Our Lady of Victory, it rings, because it wakes me up almost every morning. At 6 a.m., Father Gary's already run a mile, and I have not. But what does that song call? That the angel of the Lord declared unto Mary, and she conceived by the Holy Spirit, that she freely chose to give of herself as a disciple? Did she understand all the fine print that at that moment she would watch her son, she would lose her son in the temple, that she would be with him when he would preach to the multitudes? She would be with him when he says in John 6, this is my body, this is my blood. Unless you eat of it, you chew it, you will not have eternal life. And they all walked away. Not everyone, but a number left. And then she was with him at the cross when her heart was pierced. And she had to make a choice at that moment. Will she love God's will more than even her own son? We shall, will she freely allow her son to die and to have her heart broken? Because she says, be it done unto me according to your word. When we hear the Angelus ring, we hear a reflection also of a mother choosing the life of her child. Of a mother choosing to completely give herself, to consider the cost, 
to carry her cross, to obey God, and to love him above all else, and to renounce her possession, the most intimate gift she has, her son at the cross. And then, the gift of life. In today's gospel, Christ warns us of the difficulty of our own discipleship and the call we have. And we're challenged to purify our hearts of our own desires and of our own motives and to prepare ourselves for a difficult journey when we read the fine print and to say, today I choose to follow it. Today I will live as a Catholic by my life, by my example, and even by my mind all those things that I allow to hang out in my head, what are they? What have I allowed to run freely in my mind? What distractions, like in Philemon's letter, have I allowed to possess me? What is it that God is challenging me to offer to him? He may not take it away, but if I give it freely to him and he gives it back to me as his steward, will I recognize the gift that I have of my marriage, of my life, of even being someone in high school? And if so, have I considered the cost of my own discipleship? And am I ready to say, I believe? Because when we come up here for communion and we hear the words, the body of Christ, and we say amen, you have each one of us and myself said, submit. I commit to everything there is that I have heard, and I believe it. I may not understand it all, but I will follow it to the best of my ability. God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten from not made, consubstantial to the Father, through him all things remain, for us men and for our salvation. He came down from heaven. And by the Holy Spirit, who was incarnate to the Virgin Mary, and became man. For our sake, he was crucified and the Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day, in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. We offer our prayers and our petitions to our Heavenly Father. <clears throat> for the leaders of our church and her ministers, may they be strengthened by the love God has for them, and may His Spirit prosper their work. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. For leaders across the country, may they exercise wisdom and good judgment in the decisions they make. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. For paramedics, firefighters, police officers, and all first responders. May God protect them as they put their lives in danger to help total strangers. We pray to the Lord. Lord hear our prayers. For our parish community, may we lay aside trust in material possessions and find our true strength in following God's will. We pray to the Lord. Lord hear our prayers. For the families of Erlene Boltz, Rudy Yerzombek, and Evelyn Huntley, May they be consoled by the Lord in their grief. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. For all the faithful departed, 
and for the repose of the soul of Evelyn Hayek and Richard and Annabelle Knabel, for whom this Mass is offered, we pray to the Lord. The Lord, hear our prayers. For the needs listed in our parish intention book, and for those we hold in the silence of our hearts, we pray to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we offer these prayers and petitions. We ask that you hear and answer them in the intercession of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. The hymn for the presentation of the gifts is number 272. Take up your cross, number 272. Sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands, for the praise and glory of his name, for our good and good of all this holy church. 
O God, who give us the gift of true prayer and of peace, graciously grant that through this offering we may do fitting homage to your divine majesty, and by partaking of the sacred mystery, we may faithfully be faithfully united in mind and heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just our duty and our salvation always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God. For you so loved the world that in your mercy you sent us the Redeemer to live like us in all things but sin, so that you might love in us what you loved in your Son, by whose obedience we have been restored to those gifts of yours that by sinning we lost in disobedience. And so, Lord, with the angels and saints, we too give you thanks, as in exaltation we are claimed. You are indeed holy, O Lord, and all you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy, and you never cease to gather a people to yourself, so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you, by the same Spirit graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread. And giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. As we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven, and as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray upon the oblation of your church and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you will to reconcile us to yourself. 
Grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son and filled with his Holy Spirit may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May you make of us an eternal offering to you so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with the bless your blessed apostles and all the martyrs. With all the saints on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May the sacrifice of our reconciliation we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth with your servant Francis our Pope and Brennan our Bishop, the order of bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family whom you have summoned before you. In your compassionate, merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. To our departed brothers and sisters, and to all who are pleasing to you at their passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom, where we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory, through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on the world all that is good. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, O Lord, he and honor is yours forever and ever. At the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil grace to grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and grace to grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. Peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Let us offer each other the sign of peace. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter my room, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed.
The communion hymn is number 233, Gift of Finest Wheat, number 233.
Let us pray. Grant that your faithful, O Lord, whom you nourish and endow with life through the food of your word and heavenly sacrament, may so benefit from your beloved Son's great gifts that we may merit an eternal share in his life, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your lives. Thanks be to God. The recessional hymn is number 195, the summons, number 195. <laughs> 